Hello, coffee lovers. Today I have Cormac I, Jackson I, with me. recording this. You are on. I yeah. am. We're recording. <laughs> What's going on, Cormac? Love. You're my so favorite impressive. guy from across the um, pond. Wow, well, that's that's very flattering you to say so. I am um, across the pond being Britain, for those who don't know the, the wonderful country, still in the World Cup, unlike Germany. There we go. <laughs> uh, well as a said. Person, I'm obliged to say that. Yeah, morally obliged to say that. Uh, I'm good. No, I'm very good. Um, we were just discussing the joy, or well, the audience would know as it's all recorded, of being a coffee drinker. Um, oh, no, no, and, let's say again, because... Because I don't think they caught that part. So um, I I was joking on LinkedIn with Cormac about, um, you know, how he's subjected to his weak tea. <laughs> um, and we've we've had a little uh, going back and forth on that. Um, but Cormac uh, picked up on a line in my um, podcast. Uh, would you like to share that and like how you've used coffee? Yeah, absolutely. You, you were talking talking about um uh in your episode with the guy whose name Johnny. you said which is mm -hmm. Johnny mm -hmm. um I'm sure he's got a second name but that's Johnny that. Gian Gregorio said, <laughs> oh what, what what a name wow, I know that's... it's fabulous Gian Gregorio hi Johnny he's part of uh the lifey project so definitely there'll be a link in the show notes if you want to see our interview <laughs> His, his name's a masterpiece. That should be the name oh, of no. a gallery or something. The Jigorio Gallery. Anyway, <laughs> right, I'm getting distracted. So you were saying with him that, you know, it's it, the, the idea of having a coffee culture podcast is that coffee is this kind of universal symbol for connection. Uh, and you said specifically in the episode that it's it's a tool because people who might not even drink coffee say, hey, you know, let's get a coffee. And in my head, when I heard that, I kind of laughed because I thought, well, pretty much everyone drinks coffee, except actually for myself, I don't I don't drink coffee. It's not like a British thing. I, I just don't drink tea either. Um, and I, I kind of now it's an ongoing joke amongst my friends that I don't drink coffee just purely because I haven't had coffee. So it's like ironic. <laughs> but I thought you're right. I still say that to people. I still go, hey, let's get a coffee, even though I have no intention of drinking coffee. And then when we get to the cafe, have to you know even buy a smoothie or semi uh, ironic slash awkwardly explain that yeah I don't actually drink coffee but <laughs> you know we're here now so let's crack on. <laughs> <laughs> do you do you find like the coffee meetup for you is typically more um, social or just like being there for a friend or is it like a prime networking tool for you? Yeah, pure business. No, no time for social stuff. You know, I don't even have friends anymore. Just LinkedIn acquaintances. <laughs> and they're virtual, so I can't even get coffee with them. It's a disaster. <laughs> Do you know, if you send them weekly checks, your friends will meet you for coffee. <laughs> I've run out of money. That's the problem. <laughs> the bribery doesn't work anymore. I can't even buy them coffee. Um, no, mainly... Yeah, for, good question. Is it social? It's, I think it's actually genuinely mixed with everything. There's always there's there's the there's the work. You know, let's get a coffee. Um, I think friends tends to be more like a drink in the evening. But again, British, we're all alcoholics. That's probably why. Um, there's also the afternoon date vibe. You know, go for a coffee when like you know, maybe you've only met someone once, so you think like a drink in the evening could be a bit much, and you're like, well, let's just get a coffee. Um, so even probably more of that or more work, uh, no, no middle ground, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Probably. No, but that you use it for all three. And it's funny. Um, I had two interviews, um, one with, um, Christopher Lewis and Jamie Villamore who have a podcast called dating intelligence. And then I had one with, um, another friend, Stacy Weimer, who has a podcast called man shopping with Stacy. And we talked exactly about that, the coffee date, that it was kind of this safe space in a way, because like the commitment is sort of like low mm. level. And if within the time of standing online together, grabbing a table uh -huh. and sipping your coffee, like if the date is just not like there's no connection, it's an easy out. You're not committed to dinner. You know, you spent five bucks. What, like who cares kind of thing. Um, do you find like, 
for you then like the coffee date is more comfortable for the the first time? Well, like you say, you know, you're in the line queuing for your coffee. We never even make it to the table, sadly. You know, they figured out long before that that yeah, time to get out of here. <laughs> All right, coffee lovers. My my family here, this is why I have Cormac on because he has had me laughing for the past. Well, we've been friends for like two, two and a half years now. Yeah, um, yeah. And and I've Maybe never longer. been, I've never hung out with him in England and he's never hung out with me in the US, but like, I feel like you're like my best friend from a past life because we just laugh we, all we, the time. We've never got coffee together, unfortunately. We never got coffee <laughs> together. So, so let me ask you another question. Have you ever even just like taken a sip of it? Well, we'll, we'll, we'll get to that. Let's go back to your previous one briefly. <laughs> um, because I just, I find it funny because I think I've heard, I actually think I've heard you talking about this in an episode which went like viral, didn't it? You were, there's some clip of you, I think I saw on Instagram of basically you and some other interesting people roasting some poor chap for, <laughs> uh, you know, what was it? He, he queued up for the coffee, but his date wasn't there yet. He, she may have been late or he may have just been early. And he wanted to keep the table. So he got himself a copy, <laughs> sat at the table and then told her to queue up by herself. Exactly. I love your feedback on that. So that did go viral on uh, Instagram. Everybody go check that out. Um, that was the couple, uh, the co-hosts, sorry, not a, they're not a couple, the co-hosts from uh, Dating Intelligence. But we don't know, like I heard this on a TikTok. So we don't even know was she late or was he early? So we have to assume that mm. they they were on time or he was at least a little early because he had enough time to get online, get his coffee and sit down. So like as a good English gentleman, Cormac, how yeah. would you have handled that? Like what would you well, have done? Luckily, I'm always late. So I wouldn't have had that problem. <laughs> <laughs> All right, problem no, solved. I, all right, can't talk anymore. Let's. All right, was, let's say you time, both were late. Yeah. Let's say you okay, we're both, both were late. late. Okay, and you bump into each other right when you get there, and the line is really long. The question to you would be: Would you ask her to stay, like, stand on line with you, and even though there was like an open table, just to use that time to get to know each other while you were in queue, or would you say, "Hey, go mm -hmm. grab a seat. What can I get you?" Option A, yeah, think, option okay, B. So on, a, a, on a serious note, I think the answer is, is let's say let's say you're actually there early. First option, if the queue and you've gone and got yourself coffee because you're waiting, maybe you're you're actually quite early. If the queue's super long, you just leave together. You either queue up, get a coffee, and then leave. Um, you certainly don't make them queue up by themselves for like five minutes. That's an absolutely terrible idea. If you're there sitting down, and you've got a table. The place is not too busy uh, and the queue is you know not huge sure you know if she you know you'd be like hey um even that feels weird though doesn't it like try say that with a straight face hey you just get yourself a drink while i sit here it's there's no there's no getting out of it so i think the answer i think if it's busy it's kind of obvious which is if it's busy you don't even want to be there right mm -hmm. why would you want to be in somewhere super busy and super loud this sounds like a first date just just get your coffee and get out or even better just get out and get a coffee somewhere else Mm -hmm. if it's not that busy then you can probably just queue up with her because it's not that busy and then you can get a table together so i think i think yeah unfortunately he picked the, the worst option <laughs> i think so too i think so too i think he should have made the effort to make you know to be with her use that time together because you know coffee date is not typically super long you know maybe it's an hour or something right like you just don't want to waste that time yeah. so i agree with you i agree with you and queues are a great place to get to know someone like it's actually a thing like I think because you know you're moving a little bit there's like this thing that you're waiting for so there's kind of like a sense of progress uh you know in the the meeting slash journey and so you could be queuing for anything like you could be queuing up at a club you could be queuing up for a coffee you could be you know queuing at a bar like it's actually even if it's a great place to get to know someone who you didn't even go with you know the person who's queuing behind you or in front of you just chat to them uh which is even easier if you know you actually know the person you've come together so i think he missed the trick he didn't even fuck up like he actually missed the trick you yeah know, i agree chatting in the queue would have been great well you know what's really interesting to me is you're like chatting up 
you know, you're standing in line with your coffee date, but you're chatting up with the people in queue behind you and in front of you. So you've actually secured two other dates in that time period, right? <laughs> Unfortunately, I'm not that smooth, and uh, and I am more of a gentleman than that. So I would try not to secure a second date on one date. But you know, time's tough, right? You know, <laughs> money is time, or whatever they say. <laughs> Got to make the most of it. So, um, business, like, what kind of do you ever? You said you kind of do business sometimes at the at a coffee shop. Have you done that recently? Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is this is actually really funny so the one example i have of you're talking about the whole queuing story or whatever i was actually um i was actually in a in a oh wow my my dog has just come into my room and she's going to demand affection as all oh dogs that's do. quite all right she's very sweet puppies are allowed in Panda. the zoom actually i would have mine um, but he's sleeping she's not even a puppy she's a full grown adult child of a dog well mine um, too mine's six oh. and a half but you know we we still call them our puppy you know because they're our baby i mean i call my son my baby <laughs> <laughs> so to go to your question about the uh the coffee and the uh yeah, the business so i was actually in berlin recently for a conference and i was meeting um with the head of berlin from a, a pretty well-known bank i won't say the name just in case you know doesn't want to be referenced but Could it be Deutsche Bank? Is, I, no, I just don't know. <laughs> didn't they go bust? No, <laughs> can I make that joke? <laughs> Probably not. Um, of course you can. No, that was not a that was not a joke about Deutsche Bank. I was thinking of Lehman Brothers. You know, definitely not a sly. Uh, anyway, so I was there. I was there. So I actually did get there early, and it was really busy, and the queue was really long. <laughs> so I sat down, and I actually did get a table. But the problem is. So in my defense, compared to what I just said, A, it's not a date. B, I'm in Berlin and I don't know Berlin very well. Uh, and, and you know, see, this guy is kind of like, it's, it's well, we kind of mutually set it up, but he's a pretty chill guy, but he's also fairly senior. So he gets there and uh, I'm thinking in my head, literally the discussion we just had. So like, am I going to queue with him or should we go somewhere else? <laughs> like, do I try and hold this table? What's going on? And luckily, he he solves the problem completely by jumping straight in, being like, "I'm so glad you picked this place. Like they do the best like tarts here. My, my wife actually asked me to like bring back two home. So wait, if you just stay here, I'll I'll just queue. And do you want anything? And in my head, I was like, "Wow, so many problems solved <laughs> all in all in the space of so five great. seconds." Like um, I feel like so that's that easier. Business. Yeah, I think it's just easier with business because there's a different kind of expectation there. You're coming there to like sit across from each other and have, you know, networking kind of opportunity. Big, so if you get to a coffee business, shop and there's, yeah. yeah. And there's like one table left, then actually you did, you did a good thing grabbing it. Cause obviously you can't just stand in queue and talk business. Right. You know, what I would recommend for business. This is wild. Actually. I, I worked this out. I kind of reverse engineered this by complete fluke. Um, I met with this guy again, I won't name names, but super cool. And he wanted to, he originally we were going to meet up, but he's pretty busy. So he was like, Hey, can we then get a zoom? I kind of pushed back. Cause I think when you can meeting someone in person is always better, especially when like, you know, the travel isn't particularly problematic for you. You know, you're not catching a plane or anything. No, no polar bears died, you know, in transit. Um, and so I was like, no, no, where, where are you based? Like, let's, let's meet up. And he said, this area, can you walk and talk? And I was like, sure. I actually hadn't really done like a, a walking meeting that's like with someone new before. I've done plenty with like, you know, friends or colleagues or my boss or whatever, um, but not with like a kind of new encounter, right? And again, he was pretty um, senior to some extent. Uh, young, but senior, I would describe him as. And what was interesting was we did the walking meeting. It was really fun. Um, and we went around loads of places. And what I realized at the end was that it was way, way easier for me to recall all the details because compared to when I just sat in a single place, like a, like a, have a coffee for a meeting where, you know, to be blunt, the scenery is pretty similar. It's people that all merge into one, you know, you're not moving, et cetera. With this, the different places we walked acted as like chapters or like mental timestamps for the different topics. So if I wanted to remember what was said, I literally just virtually went on the walk again 
and at each different place it triggered in my brain what we were talking about so it was like it was like a way of like mentally tabbing what was discussed which again is really convenient because when you're walking you don't have a diary you know you can't really take notes as well uh which you can do at a sitting meeting but it's always nice to kind of be really engaged rather than taking notes so that was a really unique and kind of perfect compromise I found basically that is like, like the meeting. coolest business hack that you found by accident. And I, I love that. I, I think when we walk or do any sort of, um, exercise in general, and, and, and there's like medical scientific proof for this. I mean, I don't, I can't like quote where I'm getting it from, but I've read it millions of times that most of the clarity and aha moments, um, are when you're walking and you're, or exercising or in the shower, doing anything other than physically like pen and paper on the computer, you know, researching or whatever. So it's kind of like you blended like that hack, you, you created a hack because you're like able to have um, more clear thinking. And I love the little timestamp thing. Cause it's like by association, like here's big Ben. And we were talking about the economy hey, and exactly, right? yeah. here's the, the, the VNA museum. And we were talking about his children or like, I'll have to send a card uh, for them. <laughs> I mean, what else would you talk about next to big Ben, right? Other than the economy as, <laughs> as all good British folk should do. <laughs> big Ben's the economy. What's uh you know the Canary Wharf is um the recession, uh, which is a subset of the economy, I suppose. It's just a permanent recession in Britain now as well. So you know that is the economy. There's no fluctuations anymore. It's just one. It's just one never-ending recession. Oh man! <laughs> well, we're we might be facing down our share of stuff with uh the interest rates and you know all that, but you know remains to be seen because the market seems to keep doing all right. So I'm, I'm not sure what that means. I, I'll have to talk to an economist and I'm not sure that oh, they, they don't know either. Yeah. They probably don't know. Do you know my, my, I feel like I, I get the best advice or ideas from like talking with my son because he, he seems to be, you know, he's educating himself in the area of business, economics, and finance, but he's, he's like mm -hmm. constantly living it um, as a student and doing like co-ops and, and learning. So he's in that stage where he's like basically a sponge. So I feel like his ideas are so relevant. Like he's paying attention. He's getting from all places. And I feel like a lot of economists have kind of like grayed out in their thinking. Like they, they learned one methodology. They're still thinking that way. They're not immersing themselves with like new technologies and new ideas. So it's kind of, um, flat to me. Wow. I, I wish, I wish when I was home, like today, my mom would say such wonderful things about me. That's, uh, I don't think, I don't think I'm her one true source of wisdom, quite, quite the opposite. I imagine. Yeah. But you went to, <laughs> that's, that's you went to, to a high power school, right? You went to London school of economics, didn't you? I did go to the London School of Economics. And okay, well, that's like the sociology, end all be all. Yeah. What did you study? I still <laughs> managed to study a lot of economics. Well, my my major was sociology, but basically at LSE, you end up studying maths and economics without actually anything. You could you could go there and, and study. I mean, to be honest, yeah, that's the least mathematical subject I can think of. Like literature, and then and you end up there. Yeah. <laughs> you still basically come up with an economics degree. It's great. <laughs> That's fantastic. Well, look where it's gotten you. Tell, you know, can can you share with like my listeners, like what you're working on right now, like what you do? Sure, sure. Well, well right now, this very second, I was uh, meant to be catching up with Holly. And then she's introduced this new genius tactic of ambushing people <laughs> and turning the catch up into an episode on a podcast, which is actually fantastic. <laughs> I might steal that. I basically, yeah. the reason I'm saying that, it's spontaneous. Um, I, I basically did this to my boss. So what is, so my, my job at the moment is uh, I work for uh, Dheeraj Mukherjee, who is one of the co-founders of Shazam. Uh, they sold the business to Apple a while ago, and now he's an angel investor and a professional speaker. And so I, I kind of manage all different parts of his business uh, from the angel investing to the, to the speaking. And a part of the job is connecting those two dots, right? You know, how do you take the stories from the investing, from the people he works with, 
and turn that both into stories to go on stage to promote the companies and to promote the people but also as a form of like you know spreading awareness or like just like you know telling stories on linkedin or whatever it might be and uh he's one for he loves stories but he hates marketing because essentially he finds it you know both a time sink that he can't be bothered with and disingenuous and so what i started doing much to your you'll be very proud is i started recording our team zoom sessions because they basically end up being comedy shows uh with you know bits of insight and uh and direction thrown in every now and again and uh and then turning them with my video editor into short little like mini movies like 40 second movies like trailers you know for like just his personality the ideas we were working on etc and then putting these on on, on linkedin um and they 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 performed really well, and that they were they were great fun. And you captured that real natural essence of someone, right? Which is what actually you know an important part of my job is is you know capturing that the essence of his ideas, his character, his spirit, and helping him turn those into you know whether it's compelling talks or whether it's just kind of broadcasting that um, you know to kind of get people involved in them in whatever we're working on. So yeah, so that's a, that's a snippet of what I do very relevant to your excellent tactic of ambushing people which i'm a big fan of <laughs> yeah yeah well you know um ambushing is more fun um and you were ready for it i mean you, i i, I know your person i know your personality <laughs> yeah like you're you're the person who i could like pull that rug out from underneath and you're like you just mobilize you're like okay let's do this <laughs> I'm just, I'm just desperately wanting to be famous, waiting at any moment for someone to film me. Well, wait <laughs> is a that, minute, is that, we're, we're is that what that means? Yeah, I'll never be found. I will never carry the title influencer. You probably will though. Um, the, but you were like number one in Nicaragua for a while, so like you were an influencer there. I was, I was in Nicaragua and celebrity. I, I, I'd booked the flight. We'd got the tour all planned out. Sadly, it fell through. No, but well, but, uh, I know you yeah, don't do your, your so yeah, your the, podcast, right? I'll give the context. I'll, I'll give the context. Yeah, I'll give the context. So Holly and I actually met through podcasting. Um, my podcast was Build Your Superpower, uh, which was you know m much less well known than hers is now in season five, which is very <laughs> impressive. Thank you. Um, but back in the day when I had the Build Your Superpower podcast. Uh, and it was all about essentially the question of, you know, not how did interesting people like my boss, for example, do what they did, but why did they do it? You know, everyone says, you know, follow your heart, find what you love. The idea was like, well, that's actually really hard. Like, how do you work out what you love? How do you work out what your yes. heart is saying? Yes. Super tough, right? So we, we would introduce these interesting entrepreneurs, um, you know, like Diraj, co-founder of Shazam, or we had the founders of um, Metro Bank, which is a big bank here in the UK, or like directors of Twitter, Candy Crush, like these kind of, you know, well-known brands and be like, okay, yeah, why did you do it? Like, why was this your calling? Um, and so that, you know, was something we were really proud of. And there was a point, there was a point in peak, you know, marketing and peak kind of like, you know, build your superpower hysteria that we were the number one business podcast in Nicaragua and number five, in the business category in Kuwait, which, <laughs> Round which of was, well, I love it. What was so funny was when I shared that on LinkedIn, I shared it in a way where like the image basically looked like I was saying we were number one in like the business category. And then I clearly made clear afterwards that like it was in Nicaragua. I made jokes about always wanting to be a Nicaraguan celebrity and you know how I could finally tell my parents what I achieved and all these things. But I think a bunch of people read it as just me saying we'd got to number one. So people were like, oh my God, that's so amazing. Well done. Like now I'm getting the irony of this post. <laughs> I was basically taking a piss being like, you know, I'm finally a Nicaraguan celebrity. Uh, not that there's anything wrong with being a Nicaraguan celebrity. I'm just, you know, I'm just not that either. Right, um, right, right, right. That was as close as I got, yeah. <laughs> and, you got and you got like all these like influencer deals after that, right? <laughs> Everybody was calling uh, you. You're number uh, yeah, one. Yeah, we made we, we actually made the following week, I think, 35 million in influencer sales. But Excellent. unfortunately, the week after that, I lost it all in a gambling debt in Vegas. <laughs> so unfortunately, I'm I'm none I'm none better than I was. 
uh, and you know this wasn't on the blockchain, so this, these transactions can't be can't be traced. But I yeah. can assure you, yeah, we were we were a big deal for uh, about a week afterwards until I lost it. Damn, I wish I knew Definitely. you were in the U.S. I would have like joined you in Vegas for that one moment in in roulette when you lost thirty five million dollars. Well, the problem is if I if I told you I was going to be there, you would have also told your millions of followers, <laughs> and then I would have been harassed, and you know it would have been like you know, paparazzi and absolutely would have have gotten no sleep. You would have had to like stay up to all hours signing autographs and, you know, taking selfies with, with strangers. Yeah. That would have really sucked for you. I think I'm I'm glad I didn't. Yeah. Right. (laughs) I know. I know. You just let me focus on what I had to do, which was, you know, lose, what did I say? 35 million, something like that. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. um, yeah. At at Vegas. Yeah. And millions of followers. What would I have lost it on? Oof. Roulette. I lost roulette. It on roulette. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, that's I put what I'm saying. It, I put like it on. A... I put. I put oh. it on green. I put it all on green. <laughs> didn't didn't play off. <laughs> that's where you went wrong. <laughs> that's hysterical. Yeah. That's hysterical. So let me just tell you that like there is a blend of coffee from Nicaragua that I drink every morning. Shout out to Zeke's Coffee here in DC. <laughs> wow. That's... What does it taste like? It's it tastes really good. It's a really nice. Um, I'm going to say medium body coffee and um, very smooth, not acidic, a little bit of a a nut flavor to it. It's very, quite nice, actually. (laughs) I just realized the big flaw in my question, which is I said that with genuine sense of curiosity, but then having drunk, never drunk coffee. Your answer meant literally nothing to me. I was like, yeah, fair, warm body fair. coffee. But wait a minute. I can, yeah. What? Have you had anything with coffee? A sip of coffee, a dessert that has coffee in it, a bourbon that's infused with coffee. Like, have you ever had anything where like that taste has entered your true. mouth? I've had coffee cake and also coffee smells delicious. I have to admit, um, I'm getting more and more tempted by it, but I have had coffee cake. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And coffee yeah, chocolate, but- maybe. Coffee cake doesn't taste like coffee, but coffee candy, oh. <laughs> like some sort of chocolate. I think coffee cake got the name. Okay. This is, I guess I have to research this coffee cake got its name because it's served with coffee, but I don't believe it's made with coffee. Whereas like things like tiramisu, they use espresso. Um, there's certain desserts that do actually use coffee in it, but I think coffee cake is just cake you have with coffee. Not hundred percent sure about that. Is that even legal? That, it's that probably sounds, illegal. That like this. But you know what? You know, <laughs> it's probably illegal. But maybe if you serve the cake on a coffee table, it bridges that whole divide. This is like I when I found this out, I, I genuinely thought I was living in an Alex Jones conspiracy. Um, I found out that milk chocolate doesn't have any chocolate in it. It's just no, no. That's a lie. Not milk chocolate. White chocolate. Yeah. Apparently, no. white chocolate. Doesn't yeah. actually have any chocolate. No. It's just, it's. I don't even know what it is. It's just milk with chocolate flavoring, I suppose. Like, um, what, I th- what's going I th- on? I think it's got um, the cocoa butter, but not the actual uh... cocoa bean or something. Like, I don't I, look at. I don't do white chocolate because it's not like real chocolate to me. So I probably couldn't give you the ingredients on something that's white chocolate. It's like. It's, I don't know how to explain it. It's like having um, a, a canned Frappuccino out of the fridge at the airport is akin to white chocolate for me. Like it's nothing. It's just full of like sugar and cream and whatever. It doesn't even taste like it. So that's. Well, that's- the, gr- the green and black one is quite nice, but I, I totally agree. Like it, now I've discovered it's not chocolate. I, I'm kind of a bit disturbed. It's a little bit like. I'm not saying this is the case because I, I don't know the age of your audience, but imagine if Santa were to not exist uh, and someone were to tell you that Santa didn't exist, which, you know, obviously would be traumatic. It kind of felt a bit like what I would imagine that would feel like. You know, I've had lived my whole life, you know, just believing quite understandably that white chocolate is is chocolate. <laughs> and then to find out that that's just not true it was like wow what do I do now do I retire do I like you know is this it you know is this where it all ends I just it's I wasn't where sure it all ends. <laughs> it's where where the reindeer skid in your front yard and turn around and go the other way sorry don't don't talk to me about reindeer we, we actually live on a farm or my family home is on a farm where I'm um I am today 
and um and literally i think they were telling me that there's like a deer problem where they're turning on the lights at night um like at like you know 11 11 p.m or something and the house is just surrounded by deer like like zombies and they're just oh. <laughs> like because like the motion center motion censored light so they just come on no they turn them on deliberately to check and the deer are just like eating the garden which is sounds cool and everything but it's like my parents worked really hard to put all these like shrubs and nice plants in there around their home and stuff and the the, deer, the, the reindeer santa's are, reindeer are just santa's totally demolishing reindeer. them They're hungry so um maybe you need to put carrots out for the reindeer so that they eat that instead yeah but then the badgers take the carrots you see, there's so many no, layers no, to this problem. No, no, because Santa beats the shit out of them so that the reindeer can have the <laughs> carrots. So you're okay. You know, I'm going to plug something right now because it's just made me think of it. My animator, amazing woman called Erin Clark, uh, if anyone wants to look her up on LinkedIn, that's E-R-I-N Clark, as it sounds, because I'm dyslexic and spot, can't spell the name. Um she has a animated video called Target Xmas, which uh, I think she did all the way back at university. And it's basically what well, the original title was called was Santa Assassin. Because it's all about this like assassin who dresses up as Santa Claus to go to this Santa Claus convention to kill the real Santa. <laughs> and it's just, it's ridiculous, but it's actually really cool. It's really well done. Um, so yeah, San and Santa, Santa sorts him out at the end. So Santa has violent tendencies. I mean, oh, Santa's the good yeah. guy in this story, right. but like, yeah, but he, he, he but as a defender, no he has to, you know, yes, if, yes, yeah. Well, if yeah, you want to yeah, send yeah. me that link, I'll throw that in the show notes for everybody. I, I have, I have to tell you, um, when my son was really young and believed in Santa, by the way, we're a blended family. So we celebrate Hanukkah. I'm Jewish and Christmas because my oh, husband's nice. Catholic. Yeah. So we, we have both. That. Yeah. So my son's super lucky. Yes. If you ask the question, he's super lucky. He's an only child and he gets both holidays. So when he oh was, li- I know, I know you could be jealous of him. That's okay. Um, when, he- <laughs> when he was younger and believed in Santa, my husband used to go outside and he would take two pieces of wood um, or he would just like put his big boots on and he would shuffle in a line across no. the property to make it look no. like the sled, the sleigh had landed on the front lawn. And then he would take carrots and he would chew pieces of them on the ground and put whole pieces, then throw like a couple whole carrots out there. And so that when my son woke up on Christmas morning, he had the evidence in the front yard that Santa did in fact land on our property and and came down that chimney and then we also would have a large cookie nearby and we would take like one or two bites out of it and leave the cookie there so there was evidence that santa arrived we played the whole the whole thing that's incredible see this i feel like i wouldn't know because i'm i'm you know i'm not a parent just yet but it feels like this is the gray line a parent treads between an extremely fun existence and an extremely tedious one like on one hand that's incredibly fun right like you're faking the arrival of santa yeah, claus it was really fun. like that's just really fun but on the other hand it's like you know at what point did they, all these like little things you have to do become like shit now we got to like fake the cat do you know what i mean it's like that I know. can be boring but at the same time that's really cool and so sweet that your your husband thought to do that like what a what a wonderful gesture yeah, I you know what your son, it's... Your son no Santa isn't real. He won't listen to this and be like, "You're kidding me." <laughs> you mean those carrots weren't eaten by we, the reindeer? We this might. Whole time? We probably should tell him because he's 21, and I think that um, to continue this farce would probably be detrimental to his growth as an adult and that people will, he'll lose friends because they'll think he's crazy. So we probably should tell him the truth now that um, the Easter bunny is mom and dad and Santa is mom and dad. I probably should, I probably should pull, take the wool from over his eyes and tell him it's probably time. 
what about what about the two fairy what's what's going on with the two fairy yeah well you know i think he lost sight of it because he hasn't <laughs> lost teeth in many years <laughs> <laughs> So I think he kind of that conveniently, one swept under the pillow. <laughs> yeah, I think I think he conveniently forgot about the tooth fairy. So I'm probably I'm probably okay with that. But I probably need to say something about Santa because he might still be under mm. the um, you know, he might still think he's real. It's possible. Here's here's a question for your listeners. What what coffee would Santa drink? Oh, <gasps> that's a great question. All right. Um what what do you think he would drink? We we have to put our we have to put our you know our thoughts in. Well, I'm going to base my knowledge of coffee of the the limited exposure I've had to your coffee podcast. Given I don't really know a lot about coffee, but I've heard things. I, I think he wouldn't have an iced coffee. I've heard because like he's cold all the time, right? Like he mm. lives in the North Pole or the South Pole. He lives in one of the poles, like that. That shit. North Pole. North Pole. There we go. He lives in the North Pole. Um, so he's not drinking iced coffee. So, you know what? I think Santa Santa gets this reputation for being like fat and like kind of a bit jolly and useless. But the logistics on that guy, like he's like Amazon before Amazon, right? You know, you're talking the globe. You're talking, you know, pretty much no one sees him flying the night before. So that shit same day delivery on an international scale. So that's pretty impressive. That's Even Jeff, Jeff Bezos you know, is jealous. Even Jeff Bezos is jealous of him, yeah. by the way. Yeah, Jeff, I've seen I've seen Jeff some very drones. some very disparaging comments on LinkedIn of that Jeff Bezos made about Santa. But go ahead. Well, let's not go there. Yeah, that's why that's that's why Jeff Bezos actually stepped down. Like, because I, I think I remember reading in a in an article somewhere that um he just felt that he could no longer continue this pursuit of competing with Santa. And and as a result, uh, there was just not any purpose for him there at Amazon anymore. So naturally, he stepped down. I agree. Um, but that 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 aside, you know, I leave that between between <laughs> Jeff and Santa. <laughs> but but to, to our point here, yeah, Santa's like you know he's not fucking around. So I don't know. That feels like a shot of espresso kind of guy. You know, he, mm. he gets up. Um, or maybe, or maybe, you know, it's the 21st century. Maybe we've all been fed a lie. Maybe Santa doesn't do shit. And it's actually Miss Santa. And she's the one, you know, wearing the trousers and, you know, ordering the logistics. And he's just the face of the operation. So really, he's just there with his super milky caramel sprinkles cappuccino thing. And she's the one running the show. Um, so, you know, I there's a lot of angles there. So um, do you know Mrs. Claus's first name? Uh, I don't text his wife that much, I must admit. So so no, sadly. No booty calls from Cormac. <laughs> um actually her her name is Jessica and I won I won that in a trivia game. The Jewish girl in the room knew that Mrs. Claus's first name was Jessica from watching is that legit? all of the cartoons with my son. Yeah, it's Jessica Claus. I just wanted to share that. Oh, wow. But, wow, see, I taught you something um so important. <laughs> it's like that piece of trivia you have to That's have. That's cool. Um, I like your idea about the espresso as being Santa's coffee choice. So here's something that um, was confirmed to me recently on a podcast, but I, I knew this, but I wasn't hundred percent sure. Light roast coffee is higher in caffeine than dark roast because the more you cook coffee, you actually cook the caffeine out of it. So I think he has light roast coffee and because he's so used to having, you know, everybody leave cookies and treats and stuff for him that he has a tendency to put like a lot of sugar and, and cream in his coffee and maybe top it with whipped cream. Like he, he, he drinks it like it's a, a cake or something. That's what I think. Yeah, he's a he's a he's a he's a modern man, always on the go. He's got to combine those those calories, get that sugar intake. <laughs> Although of those sugar, sugar makes you tired. I know, I know you've random health tips on this podcast. I do. It is it is believed that you know sugar is actually very poor for energy. Um, Hi. I just got some post. Turned out it was a subpoena from Jeff Bezos telling us to stop spreading uh, vicious rumors about his beef with Santa. This but, is why I know, had to interview you. Cormac, you have like the best sense of humor <laughs> in the whole wide world. 
<laughs> you're getting I don't I don't I don't think it's that funny. I I don't really want to be uh, you know sued by Jeff Bezos. I think you're getting one too. So, <laughs> so. I've been Gosh served. Fingers. I just heard the doorbell ring. I'm being served. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> That's too funny. <laughs> Imagine. He's the kind he's the kind of guy. If, I, I don't know. I feel like I mean you've got to have an ego if you build an empire that big, right? Like you have to. So It'd be interesting to see the level of jokes that, you know, he doesn't find too funny. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, you know, Santa's pretty up there too. Do you think like, I don't know. Do you think he Yeah, can... but Santa, Santa's Santa though. Santa's like, Santa's kind of like above all that, quite literally. I mean, he flies in the sky, right? Like he's quite literally above all of that. So I feel like, yeah, I don't know. I feel like if like, I feel like Santa's like some kind of mix between some jolly fat person and Clinton Eastwood and I don't know he's too cool for school like it would take a lot like there's a bit of Denzel Washington and Santa you know take a take a lot to to rattle his cage like he's old school right you know he was he was delivering presents to the dinosaurs you know they you what, know, that's, what did he deliver that's the kind to of character them? we're dealing with here like what well, what do you think well you know like uh I, I, I heard I heard actually that the a uh, big 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 product back then was uh, hand extensions for the T-Rexes because they were so <laughs> embarrassed about their little chicken hands they would they would often order uh, little, little hand extensions you know because that was the thing back then right it wasn't like hey who can tear each other's head off because they're all pretty good at that it was like hey who's got the least stupid arms and that was how the um that was how the uh, you know the the uh, the apex or the the pyramid of society was decided back then by arm length. That's what I've read anyway somewhere. You heard it here <laughs> on Coffee. David Walter. Attenborough <laughs> <laughs> wasn't that David Attenborough season three episode four? I think I think that's right. Right. <laughs> I think I Cue right. the Jurassic Park music <laughs> now. Forget my theme song. Yeah. <laughs> You know what? Those films are getting so fucking stupid. That's going to be the third one. Like the new ones they made, they're getting so dumb. That actually will be the plot. <laughs> oh man, I'm like literally tears in my eyes here. This is awesome, Carmack. You're amazing. <laughs> I'm telling you, I I wish like I could just basically have a coffee break with you on a weekly basis because it would just set the tone for my week. Like it would just be so much fun. So I, I'm. That's very I'm, kind of you. I'm so glad you came on Coffee Culture. Thank you. Me too. I mean, we've been planning it, as you know, for Sabotage. For months. <laughs> no, no, it's, I'm, I'm, that's ambushed very kind of you to say. And, I'm flattered. Yeah, I ambushed you. You were sabotaged. You were framed. You you're being served legal paper. We've done we've done it all today. It's like guerrilla warfare, honestly. <laughs> it's like like we're ready. Um, yeah, when when it when when it truly collapses out here, and you know it starts to become some kind of giant civil war, I feel prepared now. You should. I should probably change my title on LinkedIn to reflect my guerrilla tactics in marketing. So I'm, I'll work on that. Maybe you can help me reframe my title or something. <laughs> what, what would you change it to? Like Holly uh, Holly Shannon, the Apache of marketing, or something. I don't know. Look at that. I'm not sure anybody would search the word Apache, but I really love that. No, SEO is a conspiracy. It's all good. Don't need to worry about that. <laughs> really? Really? Uh, you're probably right. I uh, I will tell you the algorithms hate me all across social media. Like I, I don't really care anymore for social media and SEO. I'm like starting to think it's all a, a hoax created by who knows who. <laughs> You know what? Fun fact. I I feel like I feel like I feel like we're we're winding down. But fun fact before you go, which is, there's there is a thing where I think like you know algorithms get. Don't quote me on this. This despite the the maths degree, there is a thing where like algorithms get so optimized that there becomes like really 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 niche exploits, which are basically like super far from like what the optimal would be. So it's like you're not actually trying to achieve the optimal. You're doing something so weird that it, it it basically throws the computer. And there's an argument that basically this is what happened in the Go, uh, the game of Go against Deep, uh, no, yeah, Deep Minds Alpha Go. I think it was it was either Alpha Zero or Alpha Go, um, where 
um, the human champion actually won a game. And there's a theory that his move was so suboptimal that the computer so unexpected it that it actually massively threw the computer. <laughs> and so wow. he ended up winning, um, which I don't know if that's true, but I think it's probably more like it was a bug. But I do remember hearing that basically um, AlphaGo had predicted the move to be like less than one in 20,000 that he would do it. Uh, and it was known at the time that it had issues where I think you know, if it would, if something like that would come up, it would kind of affect its like processing for the rest of the game. Uh, so maybe that's the future of SEO. Forget actually trying to achieve good SEO and just do weirdly niche, terrible SEO that exploits bugs in the system. Um, mm. So yeah, Apache, Apache of marketing might actually work then, you know, because it's like a yeah, word that's pretty a- out there. Yeah, I don't. I don't really think you know it's fair to the Apaches to assimilate them with you know guerrilla marketing either. But you know, when you think of Apaches, you think of like you know people out there like going at it, getting it done, no matter what it takes. Yeah, you know, I'm a compliment. So there's there's ver- <laughs> there's very few words I can use these days without feeling that I might be insulting somebody. So I I don't know what to what to say anymore. Like I'm gonna hurt somebody's feelings, so I say nothing versus. <laughs> well, this is the joy of having a sociology degree. I can just claim it's like it's like a get out of jail free card. <laughs> it's like no, 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 no. It's okay. I studied Karl Marx too. Don't worry. It's all good. <laughs> um... <laughs> so then, I don't really have an excuse. So I'm just going to say that I hang out with Cormac, who studies sociology. So yell at yeah. him and not me. How's that? Yeah, that's, that's cancel that's, cancel that's Cormac, not Holly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, can't, like uh, I'm like the airbag in the car, you know, flatten that first. <laughs> Holly's protected. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Cormac, you're amazing. Next time I have you on, I think we are going to have to force you to try some coffee or eat some chocolates with coffee in it. And we'll talk about that. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm excited. Can't wait. <laughs> so I'm going to... Mm-hmm. I'm going to let you do your thing. And I'm going to thank you so much for coming on Coffee Well Culture. done. Yeah. And I'm so impressed with the ambush. Share your thoughts and ideas on Coffee Culture. You could put them in the reviews on Apple Podcasts or DM me on Instagram. And if you'd like to support an indie podcaster, there is a link in the show notes for buying me a coffee. Please subscribe and share a cup of Coffee Culture with your friends. This season is produced by Pale Blue Studios.